and Congressman Jim Cooper. I didn't know it at the time, but they said they would like to create a Space Force. And a lot of what we're doing now in the space business is where are we going? And there are enormous number of commercial and military actors. There's the US government, both civilian and military, and industry, think tanks, and so forth. And so today's panel was suggested by a number of our panelists as a way of looking at the cooperation between the commercial and military space operations, how to protect our assets in space, and how to work co cooperatively with the US government. Um, my colleague, Arthur Herman, has created a number of, does a number of space things, and he will be our moderator. We will hear from each of the panelists just a minute or so about who they are and what their company does. And then Arthur will take it and discuss what we're going to talk about today and be the moderator and ask questions. So I'm just going to start to my right. This is uh, Jason Kim, who is with uh, NOAA, the Department of Commerce. Just tell us who you are, and then we'll go down the row and then to Arthur. Sure. Uh, Jason Kim, Department of Commerce, um, Office of Space Commerce, which is within the, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Uh, we are the space industry's advocate voice inside the government uh, when there's all these interagency policy debates and discussions about dual use technologies. And, you know, we have to balance, find the right balance between national security and foreign policy and, and, and commercial economic interests. And so we're, we're that voice. But we also have a couple of new mission areas that um, just within the last year we've taken on. We were restructured so that we we took on the licensing function, the regulatory function for commercial remote sensing uh, satellites in the United States. And we've also been um, assigned through a, a presidential directive to take on the mission of providing space situational awareness or space flight safety um, information to commercial and civil satellite operators. So. We're, we're expanding, and uh, we are hiring right now, so if you're looking for a job, <coughs> check it out. Cool. Uh, Jason is my regulator. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with Maxar, we're roughly 4,500 uh, employees uh, across the U.S. We actually uh, divide the company up into, into two main areas, Earth intelligence, the commercial remote sensing, uh, imaging as well as the space infrastructure side. So we build uh, uh, low Earth orbit, a uh, number of imaging satellites. Um, where we actually, Maxar uh, and Legacy uh, Space Systems, Oral, uh, has built uh, the largest number of, of geo satellite communications uh, satellites in uh, geosynchronous orbit. For the NASA, we're building the power propulsion element for the gateway uh, that'll be in orbit around the moon here in a few years, as well as the uh, NASA Psyche mission, which is, will be going out to the uh, um, uh, out to the asteroid belt uh, and, and uh, doing that. So, uh, exciting variety of missions from commercial, defense, and intel, uh, as well as um, as well as civil uh, uh, capabilities. So we span that gamut. Uh, we are hiring. Uh, actually, I was hired in for the younger folks here. I highly recommend getting on LinkedIn. Uh, I was literally hired four years ago. My boss, Tony Frazier, linked in me and said, I'd like to, we'd like to take you to breakfast. And, uh, and though I've been on that journey now for uh, four years, I worked with Walter Scott. Uh, actually, he helped, uh, founded the company back in 1992 with the land, when the Land Remote Sensing Policy Act was enacted in the, in the Science Committee. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, Jason and I go back decades. So, looking forward to this discussion. Good afternoon. My name's Evan Rogers. I'm the CEO of True Anomaly. About 18 months ago, I was in uniform. I was a space operations officer in the DOD for 10 years. Um, and I hung up the uniform to start a company called True Anomaly. We are building the technologies and the concepts for a more secure, sustainable, and stable space environment for the benefit of U.S. allies and partners. Um, I saw a major gap in the defense industrial base while I was in uniform um, and sought to fill that gap with my colleagues, formerly in uniform, and a, and a great team of engineers based in Colorado, LA, um, two sites in Colorado, Denver, and, Col and uh, Colorado Springs, and uh, our team in DC. Uh, we're a venture-backed startup, uh, back, backed by some, some very robust uh, Silicon Valley-based investors, um, and very glad to be on the stage with this great panel, and, and Jason's also my regulator. The, the <laughs> products that we're building are, uh, have, have the capability of non-Earth imaging. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. We're focused on the readiness and credibility of guardians as they go seek to contribute to the joint force. 
uh, and we're focused on preventing operational surprise by proliferating sensors in, in different orbits for the purpose of space domain awareness and, and non-Earth intelligence. Uh, good afternoon, Dean Bellamy, Redwire Space. I would echo to say it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invite to be with so many distinguished colleagues and friends that I have here. Um, Redwire Space, uh, uh, I oversee the National Security Space uh, uh, activities with, that we do at Redwire. Redwire, um, a lot of you may be familiar with us. We do things like uh, working with uh, with Max R. Boeing and others to do things like the uh, solar rays on like the International Space Station, and we have a partnership with you know, with Maxar on a number of activities uh, like Gateway. Uh, we also, if you are familiar with uh, the Artemis program and the optics that actually flew on the Artemis program that did uh, all the great photos where you saw the Artemis program, maybe the moon and the earth in the background, you know, Redwire uh, did that program as well. And I would also uh, really echo my friend Chris, what he said, for the young professionals, the next generation of like space professionals and leaders, what a great time to be coming into space and looking at opportunities and having a chance to whether it be work with NOAA or on the industry side or on the government side doing national security space. Uh, we were both in uniform together at the same time and, uh, and a pleasure to be up here with you as well. So, And I'm Arthur Herman. Um, I'm senior fellow at Hudson Institute. Um, I'm director of something called the Quantum Alliance Initiative, do a lot of work on quantum uh, technology and other issues, but I also uh, maintain a, a, a keen interest in, and I'd like to think some expertise with regard to space, in particular space industrial base issues. And currently, I can tell you that I'm heading up a commission that is working, uh, based here at Hudson, working on space workforce issues. Um, on questions of workforce development and so on. Now, we are not hiring, just to let you know, that is the case. Uh, however, these kind of the questions that I, I'm hoping that part of the discussion will be on one of the issues that are being confronted here in the commercial space and also in, in government space uh, programs and institutions is the question of workforce development and workforce retention. So I'm hoping we'll get some some views from all of you Absolutely. about that. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. I'm glad you were going to bring that up. I think it's an important issue we should all be thinking about, not only in short term, but long term, right? Yep. Well, it's going to be one of the issues that we're going to bring up, because I think all of you here are in for a treat, <laughs> because this is going to be a wide ranging, and uh, I think if you just listen to the to the panelists, you realize the wide range of activities and expertise and focus that space and space industry today in the United States encompasses. But I thought what I would do just to get us started is to maybe craft a bit of a, a narrative for us um, about to sort of shape the overall discussion. Uh, and it begins with once upon a time, the federal government cared a lot about space. Um, once upon a time, there was an event in 1957 when a Russian satellite called Sputnik um, orbited the Earth, and it triggered a massive reaction in the United States. And all of government, one could even say in all of society and industry effort to engage in a space race with Russia uh, to see who it was that would be the first not only to, to send human beings into orbit, but also to land human beings on the moon, with the understanding that this was not only an important issue from a point from the nature from national pride or from the uh, future economy and technologies that would come forth as a result of a moon race but also that this was huge, had huge national security implications as well, that who dominated space in the future, it was understood, would be dominant uh, on Earth as well as a, as a superpower. And in the midst of the Cold War, this uh, enterprise carried a great deal of weight and a lot of credibility with it. And in fact, so much credibility and so much effort uh, went into it that 12 years later, human beings did end up on the moon. Americans, not Russians in this case. Um, and uh, as, a, as a result of that, the effort that the federal government put into putting men on the moon 
uh, became the paradigm for a massive government effort to achieve some great uh, and, and important national or even international goal. To this day, when people talk about mo a moonshot effort, that they're referring to is what was achieved in the, in the, in the, 19, in the 1960s. Um, then interest in the part of the federal government in space began to wane. Um, the interest in sending more manned mis missions to moon or elsewhere uh, began to be seen as uh, rather more elaborate and more expensive than the government was willing to take, take on. Uh, the role of the, the primary federal agency involved, NASA, became more and more restricted to uh, exploratory, unmanned, uninhabited uh, ex uh, space exploration in the solar system and beyond. Uh, there was the development of the space shuttle program, uh, which was seen as an engineering triumph in, its, in some ways. Uh, but which was also was a reflection of a shrinking ambition for the United States government in terms of its space, in terms of its space, role in space and the importance of space. So that by the, eight, by the 1980s and 1990s, the role of the federal government and its interest in space began to dwindle and fade. But at the same time, a group of entrepreneurs from the private sector decided that they would undertake the process of opening up space, of bringing a big vision to space again. And you know who I'm talking about. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson. And together, along with a number of other commercial companies and private sector companies, they began to take up, fill the vacuum that had been created by the federal government's loss of interest in space. Uh, and in a NASA, which didn't really seem to be engaged in that kind of big vision or massive effort uh, as it had been in the 1960s. And so commercial space began to take up the slack and take fill the role that the federal government had done. At the same time, two other power, two other world powers, Russia and China, also were taking a keen interest in what was happening in space and were thinking about ways in which to use space as a means to gain strategic advantage, not just against the United States as a potential foe, but also as a means by which to expand their own power and influence as, as superpowers in the world. Uh, and that interest it grew in using and weaponizing space to the point in 2007 when the satellite sh shoot down hurled, heard round the world took place and China shot down an orbiting satellite um, it was an event which didn't really cause a great deal of interest in the halls of Washington terribly much. It was noticed, and, and, and government agencies were willing to move on. But in other countries, enormous alarm was triggered as a result of that shootdown, and realizing that space had in fact become now a potential contested zone, a contested sector, that the great commons of space would be one in which superpower rivalries and, and, and conflict could, in fact, incur and take place with it. And then the federal government also began to pay attention as well. And it pay attention in two ways. Number one is with the creation of Space Force, uh, of realizing that the Department of Defense now needed to have a service that was dedicated exclusively to thinking about the space as a domain, a contested domain for which the United States military had to now think, now confront and deal with the issues related to that. But at the same time, the second part was realizing that it had to turn to commercial space industry, which had now grown, had, had lowered the cost of space launches, for example, tremendously as a result of the, the growth of commercial space area. And that now it was going to be necessary and if the United States national security was going to be protected. It was going to have to employ and going to have to enlist cooperation on the part of the domestic commercial space sector as well. So a twofold effort has been underway, I would say, in the last five, six years, uh, certainly since the creation of Space Force. And the issue 
which now I think has to be is, is being confronted. And the one that we're going to talk about for the rest of our session today is how do we bring these two communities together? How do we bring more effectively uh, the commercial space sector and what it's doing and its activities and what it's engaged in and pursuing as part of its, a part of its economic and, and commercial goals? How do we bring that community closer together with the U.S. government community that is dependent upon space. And we're talking not just about Space Force, we are talking about NASA and its continued role, just as dependent on the commercial side. And then also to the intelligence community, uh, for whom so much of their work and activities depends upon their access to and unfettered access uh, to space uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a sector as a domain in which they're able to carry out their their national mission as well. So let me start, having laid out my master narrative, Love let me start narrative. by going asking each of you that basic question. How do you, from where you are now, from where your company is, uh, how do you see that relationship between the gov our, our government agencies, particularly DOD, and the commercial space sector working and what kinds of things would you like to see happen from from this point on should we start with you Dean? absolutely yeah i could i could talk for an hour on that one that was a great opening so i will tell you i agree with everything you said i would even date going back to 2016 even because i'll say starting at the white house rock creek was in the white house then and you had instrumental leaders on the DoD side doug lavero you have folks like damon wells and others uh, that really saw this, and we, we started something called the, um, it was called the Space Posture Review. And that led into really the White House looking at how you've got to have better, uh, really collaboration with both commercial DOD and the space traffic management with Department of Commerce. That's where there was amazing discussions with them and really looking at space traffic management and to see where that has come to date now. Uh, it's really exciting, and you're doing, you and the entire team are doing an amazing job over there, Jason. But I will tell you the difference that, first off, that I think helps is what were kind of artificial um, stovepipes and walls, right? Where you had the Department of Commerce, maybe DOD, maybe IC in a row. They started to communicate, uh, the government did, and break down those barriers and realize the value of not only with commercial, but also if you go broader with uh, how do we work with allies even better. Uh, and they really did a tremendous job with that. And so that has really, I thought, really uh, was the propulsion and initial kind of trigger that really started to see the collaboration between the Space Force and Department of Commerce on how do you provide safety for objects in space, right? How do you do space traffic management? Really a key role. How do you leverage like Maxar for doing uh, more commercial remote sensing to support the government? And really the idea of a space warfighting uh, uh, domain now is how do we have the right space domain awareness, right? They're up there to ensure we know what's going on. So I actually, um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think the government collaborating with each other better and strengthening that has really been a springboard for us. That's interesting because what you're suggesting is we're looking at looking at bridging uh, the differences, differences in culture, differences in mission, not just between the government and the commercial sector, Across but within government. the government oh, absolutely. as well. And, and I think one of, those, one of those points of intersection and perhaps conflict has been between Space Force and NASA. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're thinking about a, a, a national space strategy, which I try to do in my, in my copious free time, we think about something along those lines, part of it will be, is there a way to create an overarching national mission that, in, that encompasses both what Space Force is doing and what NASA is doing? Evan, what, what about your view on this, on this subject of not just commercial and, and, and government, and particularly Space Force, but also within the federal government? Yeah, let, let me offer a slight stage setter about why the collaboration is so important in the space domain, probably, perhaps more so than in any other domains. What happens in the space domain isn't isolated to a particular orbit, typically. So the consequences of an accident, a mishap, whether that is a mishap that, is, that comes from adversary activity or, or just an accident, accidents happen, isn't isolated to a single operator, isn't op isolated to a single nation. 
So the deep collaboration will facilitate the lanes of communicate the lines of communication that are necessary to deconflict risky activity in the space domain, uh, but also offers opportunities. I think for for what we should be seeking as as a nation with respect to arms verification and control in the space domain. Are you thinking about anyone in particular where that kind of verification would be really necessary? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I think I think that a couple of our adversaries are doing some some things in space that should draw um, special critique, given the orbits that they are doing them in and the pace of development of those counter space capabilities, and and the the antidote to that really is transparency. And you get transparency through great sensing technologies. In, in, in our experience in Trinami, there's been really two barriers to answer your, your first question, Arthur. There's been two, I would say, not barriers yet, but challenges. The first is security classification. We, we are undergoing a transformation in the national security enterprise, enterprise with respect to what we can talk about. Up until 2015, saying that space was a warfighting domain was, you could, you could not say that. Could not say that. But, but there, are, there are legacy, I would say, um, incentives, and there are, there are legacy stakeholders within the Department of Defense and the intelligence community that, that are adhering to um, ways of operating that are preventing progress. This, the second piece is the Space Force faces, I, I would say, a, a, a historically specific challenge relative to other domains. They will be expected to get the fight right the first time. First time. Right. As opposed to the naval domain and the air domain where, where small skirmishes didn't have large strategic impacts in the development of the initial doctrine and tactics and technologies. For and there's centuries of experience. And centuries of experience. Hist historical experience. Right. Absolutely. So, so you, you, you don't get very many practice rounds. So what you do in peacetime matters, which means that you have to use peacetime to iterate very quickly. And, and to do that requires a public-private partnership that facilitates iteration, that rewards iteration, and rewards not having maybe the perfect solution out the gate, but instead allows for, the, for some flexibility. And, the, and this has to start in the DOD. The incentive structure in the DOD is to take the whole problem and try to solve the entire problem first and then hand it over to industry rather than working in, a, in, a, in an iterative cycle. Chris, what, we, what about what about what about from from where you are? I'm going to piggyback off uh, what Evan said uh, there. Transparency is a powerful tool for democracies, and it is the bane of tyrants. So the the Maxar images that you see that are high resolution and unclassified that is shared uh, with our international partners and allies, as well as the news media through the Maxar News Bureau. Roughly 58,000 articles have been written about, you know, about this using Maxar imagery on that. So the transparency that's needed. And so thanks to the Department of Commerce and the Office of Space Commerce in particular, last fall uh, they allowed us to then, hey, you can take images not just of on the Earth now, you can now pivot our satellites around and look at bad actors you know, operating in, in the low Earth orbit regime as well. So um, the activities that were going on by the Chinese and the Russians during that time that were well documented uh, in an unclassified forum in a CNN special that I remember aired in December of 2016. So when Dean mentioned where we were in 2016, I, I that that uh, uh, General uh, John Hyden at the time, yep, went you know went to CNN and like I need to talk be able to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, unveiled that. There is, so about one third of Maxar has top secret security clearances. So that's how we have some insight into the government needs in this area. And we're able, and we're uh, um, a trusted partner. And so thanks to the Office of Space Commerce working through the interagency process, uh, the abil our ability to then take the transparency that you're seeing uh, you know, today in the past uh, you know, uh, year and a half on the Ukraine war, we hope to be able to provide some transparency uh, in the space domain as well. Yeah, Chase. Uh, it's it's kind of funny because um, I've been in this job for over 25 years, and we were making those arguments to the the DoD and the intelligence community 25 years ago that oh this this would be a stabilizing technology if people could see what's going on in other countries or across the borders, 
And it took us, you know, a very long time to get there. You know, the, You're talking is, about the sensing and imaging aspect. Yeah, just the fact that you could take pictures from space, um, you know, without a spy satellite, basically a commercial satellite. Um, you know, the, in the beginning of this industry in the 90s, you know, right after the Land Remote Sensing Policy Act was 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 uh, passed through Congress, you know, we we created the regulations, but the <laughs> the interagency community didn't want to allow licensing of of oval was authorized by Congress, um, and and we were just talking about you know one meter resolution imagery back then. When now we can get down to you know <laughs> much better than that. I, I don't know what the actual numbers are, and I'm not allowed to give away trade secrets, but you know you you can. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> our three tenths of a meter, and then we do double sampling on that, so you can get down to you know uh, you know 0.15 centimeters. Right. And um, yeah, there there are other capabilities that that um, we're we're arguing for. You know, we're advocating for inside the government, and um, I think you're you're going to see some news coming out by the end of the month about new uh, capabilities that we're allowing to come out into the commercial marketplace um, because we all now recognize as a government that this is this is in our benefit. It's in our national security to to allow this capability. And oh, by the way, you know, everyone else in the world is already. Providing this, or a lot of other folks um, are providing uh, similar capabilities, and, and so why would we why would we hold ourselves back from from that market? Now, from the point of view of of space and commercial space um, and access to uh, to to what satellites do up there, we also have the communications issue as well. Uh, how much of that, the issue of telecommunications in space? How much of that is also something which, again, requires cooperation between both government and also the commercial sectors in order to advance the technology, but also to protect it from malefactors? Starting with me? Um, well, I mean, a lot of the, the licensing and, and oversight for commercial communication satellites is done through the, through the FCC, and there was some news about that <laughs> overnight. But um, you know, in, in general, we we do have um, very high usage of commercial capabilities, uh, satellite communications commu uh, capabilities within the federal government and, and the military. You know, people talk about I don't know if, what the exact number is, but they talk about like eighty percent of military communications going through com commercial satellites. Um, that's a very high amount, um, if if that's really true. And I, I have yet to see that verified, but that's roughly that's roughly correct. And of and of that of the overall satellite network, satellite based network. I, I can't. By the way, I can't speak to to Starlink. I was talking about on the geocom birds. It, uh, I thought it was on the order of forty percent is DoD. The rest of it is your streaming services. You know, Directv that kind of thing. Right. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, so it's. It, you know, you mentioned Starlink. Uh, a satellite link trying to reach. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was a Here photo for the, the question. <laughs> Don't forget about us out there. Yes. I'm sorry, Chris. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, well, I mean, you mentioned Starlink, right? And, and that is a capability that, that DoD and others are, are interested in because it is one of these proliferated constellations right. of satellites, not just single points that are easy to, well, not easy, but, but are kind of sitting ducks because they're geostationary, right? So they're kind of sitting ducks in space, whereas these low earth orbit constellations are constantly moving and you know you, you can't really even if you took out one or two of the satellites that wouldn't have any effect because they're so proliferated and so you you get this inherent resilience um, by in by moving towards LEO, that kind of a an architecture LEO, LEO networks right evan any thoughts on this issue about not much that on, no not much that on comms yeah we, we, I, I will say that I, I think there's been some really interesting and important advances in in uh, commercial company access to communications. I'm really not familiar with the regulatory side. We've interacted with FCC um, from a licensing standpoint. But uh, you know, a company like True Anomaly could not have existed even 15 years ago, I think 10 years ago, because the maturity of the defense industrial base and the regulatory framework wouldn't have supported it. It would have cost us way too much money. So we communicate with our spacecraft through Azure Orbital and Viasat RTE, and that just cloud infrastructure that allows my operators and Space Force operators to log in anywhere in the world and fly spacecraft securely um, is has been a I think a tremendous value add. You know, all, sort of all of this infrastructure is getting disaggregated and commoditized and right. and it's really 
allowed us to to invest where we need to rather than build our own ground stations. Right. Absolutely. It creates an environment in which you can really sort of operate without worries about how expensive is this going to be for us to do Right. We're, we're sort of built on the ecosystem, uh, the infrastructure right, of course. that exists. Right, of course, right. you're yeah. dependent on that. What about you? <clears throat> yeah, I, I will tell you, I echo what my panelists said. I, I'll say, uh, going back to one comment Evan made, I don't know how many people use maps or GPS to get here, but if something catastrophic did happen, like to a GPS satellite, you might not have your phone. The maps are being able to use those on the phone. So we knock on wood that we never see that happen in space. Uh, but on the commercial uh, side and with uh, telecommunications, I think it's a really good example of where government and commercial industry and really even with allies too broader, where they work together, right? There are some missions that maybe aren't inherently DOD or maybe government where you can just lease uh, capabilities that are there. And it really um, goes to when you see um, both it was uh, uh, General Saltzman and General Thompson and you hear Mr. Cavelli talking about this make buy decision. If there's a commercial is already there, then maybe we just buy it versus we build it and develop it and we just use capabilities that are there. And I think comms is going to be an area where just like launch um, that they may consider, you know, looking at that is a, is a make, buy, um, make buy option. And I really echo that. I think that's a, that's a change and a pivot from what was happening in the past, right? So you go back to the 50s and beyond, there's a lot of times we saw even in the last 20 years where government will just buy something, uh, or excuse me, build it versus buying it if it's available. The COTS issue. Yeah. You know, I, one of the reasons I asked that question about telecommunications, I've, I was putting on my quantum hat because the issue, part of the issue for me is the issue of cybersecurity mm -hmm. and the security of communication networks and links in space and I've been a strong advocate that the next generation of cybersecurity in space is going to be employing quantum both post quantum cryptography but also quantum cryptography uh, quantum based cryptography and the Chinese that's one of the areas in which uh, as anyone who knows the field well I'll tell you is where the Chinese lead us uh, by far and away on quantum communications with their launch of the Missius satellite in 2016 and they've been building and, and developing that capability and expanding it out uh, in ways that I think the rest of the world, the free world, is now beginning to try to catch up with. One of the things, for example, which I would love to see is a strong push by the United States uh, of developing a quantum satellite. I agree with And that. building quantum satellite network as well. I, I echo that. I know you may not know this about Redwire, but we're actually uh, building a quantum key distribution satellite for ESA in Europe. And we're actually doing that that technology. It is. The like Europeans that. have really gotten a hold of that. So I agree honest. with you on the cybersecurity side. I, and uh, we definitely agree with you that on the quantum side. We'd love to see even a demo, right? Um, money put aside for demo and really advancing that technology and, uh, and really continue to move forward. Because the one thing we definitely know, right, on that security side, cybersecurity side, it's uh, something we're going to see not only in communications, but across the board with uh, the space to ground link, right? Yep, that is it. And then also two satellites. You got it. So you can begin the process of, of building, of networking as well. But on that, but that's for another panel. We'll have you all we can back do for that. that. We'll do another panel on that. But speaking about China, speaking about Russia, as space adversaries, both potential and actual, how worried you, are you? I'm going to go down the, go down the panel about where China and where Russia are in terms of development of their space, um, I would say offensive capabilities, offensive capabilities, and how worried should we be about that? Dean, and I, we'll go down. I'm extremely worried about it. So um, we should give a shout out to the intelligence community, Dr. Larry Gershwin and his team, folks like Mike Betts. Uh, the intel analysts, going back to you mentioned 2007, have made predictions, and the adversaries have hit every mark that they said they would hit, and they're advancing at a rapid pace. And as much emphasis as the U.S. has put on it, and I give credit to standing up the Space Force, and I give credit to the budgets that we have had, uh, and you see increase in budgets, um, the pace and the development, having seven-year cycles on satellites and build, building satellites is uh, just not fast enough for the loop that the adversary is moving at. Yep. Evan? Russia and China both deal with space in a similar way. That is that they they view space as an information domain 
and they view it as an opportunity for leverage against the U, against U.S. and allies because they know that there's a dependency. And so as a result, they've had no qualms about building counterspace technologies, none, and, and building lots of them. The Chinese electronic warfare, um, satellite communications electronic warfare brigades are massive. There are thousands and thousands of SATCOM jammers that, that China in particular have incorporated into conventional military uh, for, uh, maneuver units. So we should be concerned about it. Where, where I think we're not spending enough time talking is really about the coupling between the commercial operators and the DOD in a conflict that extends into space. Um, there have been, there, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict was a great uh, opportunity to highlight this, that commercial operators become targets when they support the DOD. And a large amount of revenue from, for commercial operators is sourced from the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. This goes to, I think, some dual use issues uh, and, and the intertwined nature of the sort of space industrial complex and the, the broader defense industrial base. And I think there's, there's a question about both the ethical and fiduciary responsibilities on the part of companies to think about how they deal with being targeted. Mm. Um, in fact, I, I, I suspect that there are some incentives that, that would cause commercial operators to be targeted first as a strategic off-ramp in a, in, a, in a broader conflict because the... As opposed to DOD. As opposed to DOD or intelligence community because... There, there is, it is a gray zone. There's uncertainty about whether the United States is, intends to, to defend and protect, right? General Saltzman has said very clearly to defend allies in space, but that, that sentiment isn't so far, as far as I'm aware, have not been extended to commercial providers. Um, so because everything that happens in the space domain, to go to my previous comment, affects everybody else that operates in the space domain, I think there's a question about how we deal with being targeted. And and yeah. the, and the the broad consequences of of uh, failure of our spacecraft spacecraft as a result of adversary action. And you know what? And that really drives home the point, does, doesn't it? About how important it is to build a strong bond and and connection between commercial and our national security uh, space assets. Because if the Chinese see those, realize how important and dependent government, including DoD, is right. on those commercial, and they see it as the low hanging fruit. That's right. For a shoot down or for disruption via cyber attack, um, then then you have you've created a vulnerability, right? You've created a vulnerability within the commercial sphere, the private sector, which the private sector needs to step up and and be aware of, and not just assume, oh, in the case of a conflict, we'll just we'll, <laughs> we'll get some great pictures of what's happening and, and images of what's happening. It's going to be yeah, much more sorry, dangerous that, than that. that. We're uh, Chris, yeah, uh, we're heavily engaged in that. We are we are members of the Commercial Space Operations Center out of Vandenberg Air Force Base. We work with the with the teams at Schriever Air Force Base in Colorado Springs as well. So we are in that, and we share information back and forth. Sure. Uh, you know, with that at an unclassified level, like uh, Evan was exactly right on the uh, on the, some of the statistics. If you're looking for a more comprehensive, uh, you know, view of Chinese and Russia, um, you know, offensive space capabilities. Uh, Dr. John Huth at Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, you know, issued out a really good report on that, and um, and we contributed to you know to that analysis. Um, I, I think you can find that online. You were on TV too about six months yes. ago. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then we were contributing that. Too. Right. Jason. Yeah, Secure World Foundation also has a good publication on uh, mm -hmm. counter space uh, capabilities that are out there, and uh, I can neither confirm nor deny whether they're accurate, but but they're they're eye opening um, capabilities, and uh, yeah, we're we're all very concerned about them. Do you agree? Um, in addition to what you're doing with space traffic management, worrying about stability and security in space, I actually think the recent push on norms in space, of norms of behavior, roles, how to act proper in space. At least it's trying to put the guidelines out there, right? Uh, you know, the rules for the road. Right, exactly. And, and the commercial sector has absolutely a role to play in demonstrating norms of uh, responsible behavior in space when they're doing things like, you know, uh, rendezvous and proximity operations, you know, getting close to other satellites, uh, but, you know, doing a hold at a certain distance and, and then, you know, 
broadcasting that to the world so everyone can see exactly what's going on. Again, the transparency. Mm -hmm. That is a normal behavior that we want to promote, and, and the commercial industry is, is part of that. Um, but, you know, again, space sustainability in, in general is a, is a huge concern for all of us, not just for national security, but for commercial and for civil space. I mean, e even the, the astronauts, I mean, their lives are at stake if we don't have uh, sustain sustainability in space that's going to prevent, you know, debris and, and uh, catastrophic kind of explosions in space from, from threatening their lives. So it, it's in all of our collective interest to maintain the sustainability of space and to keep it safe and, and to not allow a war to escalate into into space. Um, we're, we're all... We you know, have a kind of space demolition derby that's taking... <laughs> the, 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 I want to cancel The scenario that. is frightening, but it, it's all, it, it's all, it could be actual. Yeah, the, I was at NASA during that time with that, uh, the Chinese shoot down of their weather satellite. Uh -huh. oh. And, um, you know, that, that explosion in space and the orbital debris, if you haven't seen the movie, you know, Gravity, uh, with Sandra Bullock, that, uh, that's real world. They are, you know, our astronauts are having to take shelter in the space station because of um, the risky behavior, the bad actors uh, like that, when it's either the Chinese or the Russians. When we've done our, you know, when the U.S. has done it, uh, its shoot down in, in the 2008 time frame, it was purposefully done so that it would deorbit immediately. Exactly. It was not, you know, it would, did not create this debris cloud uh, like it has gone on. And that is why, you know, we need to thank you for allowing us to provide that transparency out there because flight sa we are all subject to the same flight safety risks and we need to mitigate those risks. Uh, you know, for that, to what Evan said earlier about, you know, about the, the bad actors on us. A path to s space sustainability is integrated deterrence, and commercial partners have a responsibility in that. I agree with that, and I think one of the key elements of that integrated deterrence is going to be better, really, space domain awareness of what's going right. on. There's so many gaps of knowledge, and I think that's one of the first places, if you had one more dollar on the commercial side that should be invested in commercial, Right, you've got two operators here that would be the right, you know, folks to actually go, you know, to, to provide that better information and situational awareness. And I, I guess in terms of the, the you, we discussed earlier about the U.S. government recognizing this is this is a priority need. Um, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall, to which you know the Space Force report to, his first operational imperative is um, is the space order of battle. Now, what is it, you know, those of us who you know, worked in this knows what that means. But that is, you know, know your enemy's space order of battle and know your own. So I agree with you. So if you think about it, I'll, I'll throw an analogy out uh, if that's okay. So, like, if you think of it, a lot of us drove cars here to get here today, and the cars have rear backup cameras, right? Um, can you, and I grew up driving a car like a 1970 and 60 car that had no rear backup camera, but you wouldn't think of buying a car today without it. So having better, like, situational awareness right up there on satellites is to me makes a lot of sense just like having a review camera on a car would yeah that's interesting i mean to me it's more like having a windshield <laughs> oh, <laughs> even better so jason great analogy that sounds mm -hmm. good right i mean if you think of it at home right at home most people have maybe a ring camera or something like that at home can you imagine 10 years from now everyone will probably have it can you imagine that they're going to say, what you mean you didn't have a, the ability to know somebody is knocking on the door and it's a package, right? I mean, it's the windshield, right? I like that analogy, Jason. Uh, you know, if you think about the, the airspace, taking a different analogy, right? We, we've been able to pack more and more and more flights into the same airspace. Why? Because we have better situational awareness. Right. We have ADS-B, which is GPS-based, so we have a, a more precise understanding of exactly where all the, the, the vehicles are. That's what we need for space. That's what we're trying to build with our space situational awareness capability that's, that's leveraging a lot of commercial capability that's out there that's better than, um, or at least provides better coverage than what the DoD is, is covering right now. Right. So we want to consolidate all that and, and share it with the world and, and, again, provide even more transparency about what's going on in space. Jason, the air, the air analogy is a, is, a, is a useful one here, and actually the naval domain is too. You, you talked about air being more contested and more congested, there are also things like norms of behavior in the air domain, right, that are, that are proceduralized. Yes. For example, air-to-air -air intercepts. Air-to-air -air intercepts happen all the time. The, the corollary to that is, is a rendezvous and proximity operations activity in the space domain. And very rarely do air-to-air -air intercepts result in any sort of catastrophic activity. 
So there's there's ways that I think the industry partners and the government can work together to establish those procedures, demonstrate those procedures, and, and adhere to them. Um, and I and again, I think I'd, I'd like to see industry come together and sort of lead that charge because we really are building the first generation of proliferated rendezvous proxops, proxops technologies. And, and that's dual use, it's, it, whether it be for NASA or civil, right, or on the DOD side, right? So um, it would really be a dual, dual use thing. And I think industry leading is a great idea, Evan. I think that's awesome. Um, I have a feeling that we're going, to, we're going to have a lot of interesting questions from our audience. But before we go to that, I'm, what I'm going to do is to wrap up this portion of the discussion is give each of you a minute to talk about what you, as you look down the road the next 10, even 15 years, what are going to be the key drivers in terms of where American space leadership is going to be going, but also where the growth, what are the key drivers or obstacles to the growth of the commercial aspects of America's space enterprises and f as, as far as they go. And, and I will be disappointed if you don't mention workforce for selfish reasons. Workforce is part of that, but a, a minute each, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Jason, you want to kick us okay. off? Okay. Thinking five, ten years down the road, I mean, mm -hmm. by then we'll we'll actually have the the landings on the moon and the cislunar activity taking place. Yeah. And, you know, to me, that's that's always been kind of a fantasy, but it's really happening, and and uh, we're going to have you know things like the Starship operationalized, where we're going to have access to space that is, I mean, hundreds of times cheaper than it is right now, and and you'll have so much more activity than even what we're seeing today, which is already kind of crazy <laughs> compared to five years ago. Um, we're we're going to need more um, government involvement. I don't want to say regulation, but we need more oversight of, of what's going on. And we would also need to clear the field so that um, regulations don't hold back all this commercial innovation. So it's, it's going to take a while to, to put those things in place. Chris? I see a lot of young people in the audience, and um, uh, Jason's older than uh, than uh, we worked through this in the '90s uh, in the in the GPS, um, uh, you know, changing that the uh, changing that policy for the dithering of the code, you know, kinds of things. These things I worked on when I was early in my career, uh, right, was the working on GPS and and the proliferation of that capability. Um, I have to say, in, in setting the table for the history, I think the, uh, especially what enabled uh, SpaceX and Elon to take off was the government investments, both in the uh, Air Force side and NASA side uh, for his Falcon rocket and right. uh, delivery of cargo and then crew to the International Space Station. Um, so that retirement of the space shuttle has allowed the, the U.S. launch industry to really take off. Now we're filling them up. Now that it's so much cheaper to get into orbit, and we are we have taken share away, for, uh, launch share away from a uh, number of international um, competitors. You know, on this now the satellite applications, the the growth of satellite applications, like what Evan is doing, what we're doing, and others are doing, is is really taking off. And the message that I've I've given to a number of of guardians, space guardians, is that are younger, is that. This is the most exciting time I've I've seen in my career. Uh, that uh, everyone is working really hard. There will be failures along the way, but the we're going in the right direction, and it is an innovative direction, and that is what is attracting workforce, yeah. uh, you know, into this. For us, in, in terms of uh, commercial remote sensing um, and commercial imaging, we're what we're seeing uh, as a result of our transparency operations in Ukraine is that um, our, our growth in international partners uh, is really been skyrocketing because they want to be able to leverage our, our capabilities uh, as well. We'll be, uh, we'll be launching our next generation um, satellites here soon and um, we're going from handling 4 million square kilometers a day of imagery to 525. The growth of artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to handle this much data is is uh, is necessary, and we are hiring like crazy. Uh, if you if you know C plus plus, Java, etc., Python, give us a call. There, there is my workforce. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>
one of the hallmarks of being a startup CEO is that I am focused on the next week and the next month. Let alone thinking five, ten years out. Well, we do think about it. And we started this company, uh, my co-founders and I and, and the team that I've been able to, we've been able to assemble, didn't start this company to build a, to, to get acquired. Um, we built this company because we recognize the need for a secure, stable, and sustainable space environment for U.S. allies and partners. Um, we have a we have a grand and exciting vision, and I think what that looks like is proliferated sensors in all orbit that create a more stable environment, that create transparency, that create opportunities for diplomacy in a more connected world, um, and. We're very excited to be part of the journey, and uh, we are also aggressively hiring. 40% uh, remote workforce. Uh, we're standing up offices in DC and LA, and we have a headquarters in Denver, brand new, beautiful factory where we're going to be pumping out one jackal spacecraft every five days, unprecedented scale for a complex Proxops capable satellite. Um, so if you want to come join the team, Give me a call. See one of my team members who are here. Um, but what's, what's that number again? Yeah. <laughs> I, Evan I, Rogers at LinkedIn.com. <laughs> rising number of spam phone calls after doing all this. So yeah. I'll bet. Yeah. Dean? One, I I agree with you and uh, uh, and all my panelists. So I will tell you what I see. A lot of people saw Oppenheimer, right, the movie recently. So we won't maybe have something established as like the Manhattan Project, but I think it starts really with government. And I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see those continued collaborations between Department of Commerce and Space Force and NASA and everybody come, to come together as a really one direction and unified over the next 10 years. And I really see that. And then I see um, the ability for them and us to work really well together on the commercial side. I see, you know, continued work where, example, I think you're going to see collaboration between commercial and Space Force doing a space domain awareness project like you're talking about doing, preventing something catastrophic, mm -hmm. right? Um, I see uh, collaborations expanding where more commercial is leveraged, remote sensing. I think you're going to see commercials role in that continue to expand and expand because it's contributing and playing such a vital role. And I actually see that we're going to do amazing things on the biotech side, right? I think if you look on the NASA and NOAA side, whether it's more pharma work, uh, more greenhouse work on the International Space Station, whether it's more some of the things like 3D printing and doing things like that on the International Space Station, I think you're going to see a lot more growth in technology. So from a workforce perspective, I would say that it, for our generation, if you go back to 1959, 60, you're at that mark. And for the next 25 years, is probably going to be the greatest, um, really, 25 years in space ever, I think, on the high tech side. And really, if you look at the VCs, we don't talk about the VCs, but companies like A&E have invested so much money. And the people uh, on Wall Street that have helped out to support the space industry have been another third leg to the billionaires to really allow us to excel at a rate we couldn't have seen before. And I don't know if we give them enough credit, and we should, because they have played a really vital role uh, really helping out the space industry. Yeah. Should we open up to questions? Um, what I have, there'll be a microphone come around. I told you there'll be questions. Um, I, I'll we'll be coming around with a microphone. If you can, in asking your question, just identify yourself and whatever affiliation you care to disclose. The one thing I, one proviso I put in is not to have questions about UAPs. <laughs> <laughs> we'll actually be meeting in a classified section afterwards to discuss. No, we that's won't. Actually pretty much. <laughs> but in any case, but that, that's the one I, place where I don't want to go. But anyway, for everything else. So we start here at the front and then work our way back. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen, and thank you for your time. I'm Chris Orr, Senior Defense Editor for 1945, proud Hudson donor, and uh, former Air Force Security Forces Officer. Uh, I hasten to add that the enlisted portion of my Air Force career was spent with Air Force Base Command at the frozen tundras of Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, safeguarding Minuteman Three nuclear ICBMs. And before I ask my question, I need to throw a good-natured jab at Chris. Chris, as a proud USC Trojan alum, I'll try not to hold your Notre Dame grad status, alum, <laughs> alumnus status against you. Uh, that, 
had to throw, I just had to throw that out there. Now, that aside, my question, the proverbial elephant in the room, EMP, electromagnetic pulse threats, um, whether you, the people here love Donald Trump or hate him, the fact is he's the only president who's ever made a serious effort at addressing deliberate and EMP strike threat. Now, in, in fairness, Barack Obama did address naturally occurring MPs, i.e. solar flares such as the uh, Carrington event of 1859. But again, Mr. Trump, in, especially with Executive Order 183865, is the only POTUS to actually address deliberate man-made EMP attack. And as I've written a couple of my op-eds, the, the Biden your, administration... Did you get your question? Yes, yeah, sorry. So the point being is that what is now being done to address EMP threat that you gentlemen are willing able to discuss in an unclassified forum? Thank you. Yeah, there, um, I'll, I'll take a stab at a, at a, at a certain level. Yes, uh, electromagnetic pulse, uh, you know, is a, a dangerous threat. Um, can't talk about it too much in open forum, but this is something that has been uh, pursued um, uh, from near peer competitors with uh, with that capability, and uh, the mitigation tech. There's a there's a couple things on mitigation techniques in terms of hardening using different frequencies, um, you know that kind of thing that you can that you can do. Um, but Lowell, uh, the the chief technology officer for Maxar uh, came from Lawrence Livermore National Labs, where he worked for Edward Teller and. Uh, and Lowell Wood out there, so uh, we were we are deeply reminded of that of, of those of that threat. We had a que and then a question on this side as well to the third row, and then I'll come around to this side. I can't say go Irish one more time, <laughs> <laughs> please. Ed Voorhees, Covington and Berlin. Uh, in talking about threats, uh, we heard China and Russia mentioned a lot. Obviously, uh, my question goes to. Uh, organized crime, gray area, deniable threats. Uh, think about the Wagner Group. Think about the little green man in Ukraine in the very beginning of the conflict. Could you say a word about what is the level of risk of these kind of gray area, organized crime being used, being used? Non-state actors. Non-state actors, but, but maybe they're state actors, but they're deniable. Right. All right. It, the solution that's a multi intelligence uh, you know problem and you have to and so we approach intelligence you know our support you know we're primarily in the geo in you know part of the business but there's human open source uh, etc in order to corroborate the various evidences and that that is what is uh, going on when you look at at the atrocities in Buka and who in Russia you know, was involved in that so we're working you know Maxar is working with State Department and others uh, in terms of putting the, the file together of evidence of who was responsible. Peter, do you want to take a shot at that? I'm, I just have to apologize to my panel. I have to host John Harvey, who's doing an NSA nuclear seminar in like one minute down the hall. So I want to thank all our friends here, and you particularly, Arthur, for coming here. And uh, it's been a delight to have you, but I apologize. I do have to run down the hall. But we're not breaking up the party. No. Oh, okay. Okay, very Peter, good. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else want to talk about the role of non-state actors in space or the ways in which uh, this can be a, a threat ap apart from the one that comes from, let's say, in terms of superpower rivalry, but, but also simply, in other words, as space becomes the wild, wild west, are we going to end up with a lot of sort of rogue actors in the... In I haven't the, mentioned the gray zone. That, that is totally gray zone operations. It, it definitely is. But I look at General Saltzman, right, who's talking with, he just did change of command with General Sheba on the orbital test range and the STARCOM, right, which is your Space Force Training and Readiness Command. And I really think General Saltzman is uh, worried about everything, and this would be a part of that. And by making sure that he's putting the right, the most robust training plan and uh, to really take those procedures and build the muscle memory for those guardian operators, I'm very encouraged by that as a priority and encouraged to see them looking at that as ways that whether it's a state actor or maybe a potential non-state actor doing something, that we have people in place trained and prepared to handle those situations. Yep. Question here, and then I'll work our way back. Sam Visner with the Aerospace Corporation and also uh, Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the Space Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Just two brief comments. First, on norms, uh, I've done some work on this, and what we found so far is that while norms for space systems have held up fairly well up till now, 
Norms for cyber systems have not. And in fact, they seem to be eroding. And as space systems become more dependent on cyber systems and vice versa, there is reason to be concerned that the norms that have protected space systems will erode alongside the, the norms associated with cyber. The other thing is I just wanted to make you aware that the Space Information Sharing and Analysis Center, which is up to about, what, 80 members now, is working with, as a bridge between government and industry on cyber threat miti threats, mitigation, event intelligence, and is serving as a bridge mostly on the unclassified side to ensure that there is good correlation. Um, so this, I think, is, is part of the sort of collective defense um, and, and integrated deterrence strategy that I think our country needs. And if you're interested, we can talk to you more I'd about this. I'd love to do that. I'd love to hear more about Thank that. Thank you. And then on this side, we had a question there. And then when, why don't we start with the one there and we'll move across. Which one? Either way, <clears throat> give him the microphone first. Yeah, uh, first. Uh, Ken Meyer Court, uh, retired. Uh, my only expertise in space is uh, knowing who Flash Gordon was, oh. which someone will have to explain that to the kids. Um, and I did, don't know what it was we weren't supposed to talk on, AUP or UAP. I don't know what that is. <laughs> My question is, uh, is whatever creates crop circles space-based? Um, just went there. <laughs> yeah. I think, we'll, I think we'll, we'll save that for the classified section as well. Okay, okay the question to the back there. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, Bruno D'Souza. I'm a Fulbright visiting scholar at the Space Policy Institute. Um, thank you for your remarks. I'm conducting a project on space traffic coordination. Uh, the European Union and the U.S. share the oldest space alliance, and at the same time, they're the biggest economic bloc. From the private sector point of view, you, you spoke about ESA. Uh, EU is the biggest client of ESA. So where would you like to see the European Union move? I'm, I'm thinking spe specifically about the EU being a big bureaucracy, uh, uh, clawing for power and uh, through regulation. Where would you like to see them move? Uh, you know, thank you. That's a great question. And, and it opens up, I think, again, the big difference between the first space race and the current one. First one, there was two players, right? There was Russia, the Soviet Union and there was the United States. Today, in terms of space power, in terms of use of space and development of space, we've got a multitude of countries that have now become involved in it, which means it's a much more complicated playing field. But it's also the case that so many of those players are U.S. allies, including your, the EU and including the countries and including NATO. And so in what ways does the international dimension of the growth of space commerce, but also of, of the use of space, how does that both complicate the picture for the United States, but also perhaps open up opportunities that our competitors, Russia and China, kind of miss out on? You want to take that one, Evan? Yeah. Broadly, international cooperation is is clearly a net positive force. I think I think the EU is an untapped resource here, and I and I think that is likely to wake up in the same way that sort of you've seen some of the awakening of NATO vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine. Um, the reason I mentioned NATO in particular is because there's sort of an increasing awareness of supply chain issues associated with a protracted conflict. That is very very poignant when it comes to space because you, you just don't have the infrastructure that's capable of generating replacement units for, for things that need to go into, into a space domain. Um, so I, I think there's an opportunity for leadership. I think the initial step to that leadership is likely via NATO. Um, and and that, I think that's where certainly where Chernobyl is trying to plug in. I could throw in, um, you know, the EU has always been a, a great ally in terms of space cooperation. Um, across a whole number of areas, you know, Earth observation, GNSS. Um, although in the beginning, you know, we talked about GPS, Galileo was, was viewed as kind of a rival to GPS, and we, we actually made efforts to try to, you know, throw a banana peel under their program before it, you know, became fully operational. Um, that's not really the case anymore. We, we found a way to, to work together and actually get more benefit when you use GPS and Galileo together at the same time. And in fact, it's not just the two of us, it's, it's all nations that are developing GNSS. And we've created an international committee on GNSS where we kind of align our standards and our commitments and our transparency, uh, our documentation, so that we can all work together and get the benefit. That's where I'd like to see us go for space situation awareness. 
that, yeah, we, we have our own system in the US, the Europeans have the EU SST system, Japan has their system that they're developing. Um, you know, we can, we can federate all these systems. They just need to be able to talk to each other. We need to develop the standards and the, the, the data transfer capability and, and the formatting to make sure that, you know, they use metric system. We don't, <laughs> we don't, you know, that they can actually input the same data together and, and come up with a better product. I think it's just a, you know, Google does that kind of stuff every day, right? Right. Taking all kinds of diverse information, putting it together. Uh, we can get there too. Um, it just, it's going to take some work. Dean, you mentioned EU, so go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say um, to that question specifically, right, if you take a typical dime strategy, right, diplomatic, information, military, economic, and you apply it holistically, we've done pieces and there's areas, like you mentioned, not only with Department of Commerce, but U.S. Space Command has done like SSA sharing agreements and things like that. But, uh, but taking a step back between the two um, really entities and looking at a broader dime strategy that makes sense for both parties would make uh, a lot of sense, right? Um, the piece where you heard General Saltzman, as you mentioned, Evan, talking about, you know, will we protect allies and all that is a piece of a broader strategy. I think that that would be something that would be welcomed, uh, I think, by but whether it be EU, EU, NATO, and also the United States. And the you know, EU has taken a big leadership role in quantum satellite development. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, I mean, <laughs> their deadline for launching one, I think, is like, like in 10 minutes. I mean, they're, they're, this is not some far off, you know, dream that one day will happen. They've, they've, got, they've laid out the plans for it, EU has. Uh, and I would love to see the United States becoming one of the four, one of the a, 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 a fourth uh, quantum satellite launch program that would be integrated with the EU and also with the, with the other two. So Arthur, I agree wholeheartedly. And from a Redwire perspective, if you think of it right, um, when you mentioned, Evan, earlier about security clearances and, and there's barriers that we have, right? But if, you're, if there's a way there could be co-development, whether on the commercial side or on the government side, you know, um, there's probably benefits across the board. But being able to share that data, collect that data, as you talked about, um, even the standardization of how you would do that. But I would love to see greater collaboration in that area because I think it just makes sense for the U.S. and allies as a whole, right? And, and you can even go broader than just Europe, you know, you, there's a lot of folks that are out in uh, the Pacific that are great partners and allies in the United States, so. And, and I just think that the area of quantum communications in space should not be, leadership should not be left to, the, to China. Absolutely. Uh, I think that that's, and I think the EU is stepping up is an important step in that direction. Next question. The gentleman here to the, to the there, there we go. Mitch Ledbetter here. You talk about sharing data and SSA data. What about the integration of international components being integrated together? That's a great question. So go ahead. I'll jump and then I'll let folks in there. I think we're very risk adverse sometimes uh, on the government side of using some of these international components, maybe from a cybersecurity perspective. But I think if you put a cybersecurity framework in there looking at the software, to evaluate the software to make sure that there's no cyber effects like you could have, as you mentioned, with commercial earlier, to mitigate those cyber vulnerabilities, then I think there could be a broader use, right, of those components uh, where it makes sense, where it's appropriate. Um, I know at Redwire we do a lot of cybersecurity on space components, but it might be broader than just that. Um, but that's a great question. What do y'all think on it? Outside of Maxar, but um, I know that we're flying some, pay some SSA payloads uh, with the Japanese, for example, I'm not uh, like QZSS. QZSS, right? So there is there is co collaboration going on. Also, ground networks, um, say ground-based radars, is going are going into other countries. So in terms of working that, so it's more of a of a ground to space you know type operation through radar or electro optical. There, there are aspects of the um, the U.S. based space industrial base that have not been able to meet our needs. We have had to go to international companies. Is that right? Particularly, I mean, primarily UK uh, and and uh, a couple of European companies, but we just were not able to get components fast enough at a reasonable price from some U.S. providers. There are many awesome U.S. providers that we leverage for for the Jackal spacecraft and future spacecraft going forward. But it is not you can't you can't get the job done with just the U.S. supply chain. Are we talking about microelectronics or other kinds of things, or can you talk about it? Lot, lot, I, I, I'd rather not name our suppliers, but but no, I don't understand that. Significant subsystems that are critical.
beyond electronics. Beyond um, electronics. We've had to source from international providers. Interesting. Interesting. Do we have time? I think we have time for one more. If someone wants to wants to launch a query at this point, here we go. Well, hi, Matthew Tweeden. I'm interning here at Hudson. I wanted to ask a little bit about workforce development and the fact that multiple times y'all brought up employment gaps, opportunities. From the employment angle, where are y'all seeing skill shortages? Where are y'all seeing barriers in the talent pool development? Uh, whether that be shortcomings of policy, the limitations in, in security clearances or whatever, uh, the talent pipeline, and what can be done on a policy level to address that? Oh, I love that question. I love that question. Great. Um, good intern, by the way. Um, plant. He's probably, uh, I love he's that. probably on LinkedIn right now. <laughs> <laughs> please do. Please send a LinkedIn note. No, I will tell you um, uh, one area, right? We um, are hiring as well, like my uh, colleagues here. Uh, but we're, but I will tell you, um, on the software side, system engineering side, mechanical engineering, physics, and, um, and mechanical engineering, a lot of those are really important skill sets we want to have. Um, but cleared, um, the billets is an issue on the security side. Um, it's very hard to get cleared engineers from the government unless you have a direct contract. This is one where uh, companies like ourselves can be at a disadvantage. Uh, because there's not an a, like there's not an approach from the U.S. government to like incentivize some commercial companies with extra security billets. So it does it is a limitation in Achilles' heel for some. Say um, it again. Security billets. So if unless you have a contract, right, and you get five security billets, it's very difficult to actually have cleared. Uh, even if they have a TS clearance to be sitting on an SEI billet, right? To be sitting on a billet with the government. And so unless you have a bunch of them, unless, uh, unless you have a bunch of contracts like uh, a Lockheed or Northrop. Those specific billets. You, yes, yes. So therefore, what you're limited from, so for competition, uh, let's say you want to compete on a, um, uh, we'll just say an NRO program because uh, or somebody like that or a, a top secret program where a big company like a Northrop or Lockheed has thousands of people cleared, if you wanted to go compete on it, you may only have five or 10 or 20. So it is definitely yeah. a limitation. So you're, you're stuck. You are right, stuck. With a limitation. You can, be limit, you can be stuck. So I would say um, security billets is, uh, is a challenge that we all face at different levels. It is it's just a challenge. Um, but I'll tell you. Is that true? A absolutely. Evan, Chris? Yes. I'll say there's, there's two issues that we face at Chernomaly. The first is quali really qualified clearable individuals who have the latest and greatest practices coming out of their universities or, or other companies um, that, that we typically source talent from. So it's not so much that there, there's both the part, the part of having already had a clearance, but not having a clearance, and then it taking 24 months to get through the clearance process. But, you know, and we're not, that's not a pace that we're really moving at. So we're actually having to hire, we're, we're having to hire on the front end with the expectation of receiving classified contracts just because it takes so long to get through the process. The other piece I really want to highlight is the diversity of the workforce. We, we it is very challenging to hire a diverse workforce into space and aerospace and into tech in general. We really value that. Um, but it, but we're thinking about how do we invest so that we can, we can, you know, in Colorado and in California to make sure that we have access to the best talent that we can possibly get. Um, Chris, at the, at the policy to execution level, um, I know there was some legislation a couple years ago to speed up the process for security clearances, and now it's it, we're, we have benefited this past year. I, it's gotten better. It's, not, it's, it's nowhere to where it needs to be, but it's better. Uh, and so we're not, you know, not done yet. That's the execution. I do have to say, though, Maxar's brand recognition because of the war in Ukraine and people's awareness of Maxar and our imagery and the sense of mission that the that we have and that we bring to our work, um, we have gotten some outstanding uh, resumes. They're coming in better than they were in years in years prior. Um, so we've we've been able to take advantage of that and uh, in terms of you know, filling our, our workforce needs. Um, so it's, things are, are getting better in that, in that regard. But it, it, it's always a tight market. There's, the, there's the, the, the people, then there's the skill mix, you know, for that. You know, we cannot, uh, you cannot hire enough uh, really good software engineers. It's because it's, uh, that's what you're looking for. Because there's, a, there's, a, there's specialties within specialties there, uh, you know, for that. So when we talk AIML, it's like, there, that is a, th those are people that are, 
you know, 10 years into their career, say, you know, kind of thing, because they've, they've worked down this path. And now what we've been able to provide to them, like, as I mentioned, we're, you know, we're dealing with petabytes of data. We're 100, like 125 petabytes of data on the Amazon cloud here right now. So that if you want to do, do the most cutting edge AI ML work, you're able to swim in an ocean of data. This isn't just data lake, you know, kinds of stuff. So it is incumbent upon us to let folks know about that, about like, this is why people want to come to Maxar. This is the, uh, is the work is challenging, it's meaningful. Uh, it's not sim simply, you know, doing software coding on a dating app. So you, know, you really get a chance to really stretch yourself. Yeah. If, if yeah. you're an AI ML but, engineer. But, you know, but we, you know, but we are, you know, so there's the sense of mission and then there's, and then there's competitive salary as well. So Chris, I think you brought up culture is another key aspect of the question, right? The sense of mission that you were talking about there, Evan's been talking about it also at True Anomaly. Uh, we've got it as well at Redwire. That culture really is what, um, when you do that and you pair it up with really offering meaningful, like fun jobs for folks, is what's allowing them to say they can come in and make a difference now, right? And, and be a key player now. And uh, we're really seeing that on our side too. And that's what's exciting when I really do think the next 25 years for the folks um, that I wish and hope to be around and involved in it for the next 25 years because it's going to be an exciting ride with all that they're going to see that's going to transpire. Jason, do you have any last words on this or any other issue before we close down? I mean, the workforce issues that we're facing are, are different because we're a government agency and we're just you know inept at, at hiring at all. <laughs> but um, we, we're we're authorized for like 35 billets right now. We we've got like half of them filled because we just can't get our HR system working. But you know I think that the space industry has um, this has had this challenge. I think you're overcoming it with with things like what you talked about, um, where you know you could put all the investment that you want into the STEM in uh, like field and education, but then those kids will just go off and like get video game jobs or special effects in the movies. Right. Um, and how do you make space more appealing? I, I think, you know, what you talked about with mission oriented or, or like helping sustainability of the, of the earth's, you know, orbits. I think that's more of a, a thing that, that the, the Gen Z will, will respond to, you know, that, that they're doing something meaningful in their, in their lives. And then you, you've had the, the SpaceX, you know, the, the missions that were, you know, all over the news, you know, with these astronauts, and then we're going to have Artemis. I think those are things that, that are really going to help re-spark the, the uh, you know, the, the inspiration for, for the younger generation in the same way that Apollo did. Look, space is cool. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And it, no, I mean, it, it wasn't, you, though. You cannot, you cannot, it was not. Um, but... If you, if you put together the way in which space has been sold in the broader culture, whether we're talking about Star Wars or, or the, 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 the whole presentation about <clears throat> what, what, what can happen, the possibilities of taking place in space. <clears throat> but then also, too, I think, come back to Maxar and Starlink and about the war in Ukraine. Suddenly, the reality of what space, how that can be decisive uh, on, in, in the battlefield or in the battle space um, I think is also something that sparks imagination. If you have, if you have an industry that sparks people's imagination, especially young people, that's a really, it's a really hard asset to squander, unless you're really trying. And I think it's the one that we really need to cash in on as we go forward with with everything that we're doing here. This has been a great panel. Let's thank them for our presentation. Great. <laughs>